Please sit down. Good afternoon. How was the morning teaching? Very good. What did he say? <laughs> my one, my cousins, when they go for the teaching, and then they, then I ask them when they come back. What did he only say? How was the teaching? Said, very very good. What did he say? Very good. <laughs> So His Holiness this morning, as you all know, said that Buddhism is very open-minded and very scientific. Some of the very short comments he made is very powerful. Right, then he spoke about his connection to Tsongkhaba. And he said, even if you call me Lobsang Tagba or Tsongkhaba, it's okay. <laughs> Things like that, right? And uh, then while giving this transmission of uh, 100, 100, 100 deities of the joyous land, which he read in the end, so there, there he emphasized on this one point, where there is this line which says, So just, just for your information, since you attended this morning's teaching, you know, this, uh, So, <clears throat> this short text that you read this morning is basically talking about Guru Yoga. And he mentioned that uh, Guru or the teacher is very important. And this is something not peculiar to Tibetan tradition, but it is important in all the traditions. Like Jesus is important for everybody, Guru Nanak is important for everybody, right? So like that, in that context you should understand. Because the gurus or teachers are supposed to share with you some of the processes of doing this internal journey to an unknown land. Even when we study, say, carpentry or tailoring, which is something we can see, but still we need to learn from a teacher. If this is the so, then what need is there to talk about the need of having a teacher who can guide you how, it, how to make this internal journey, especially the journey to the next lives. So therefore they are very, very important. Yeah. Having said that, as I already mentioned, it is important that you, you meet with the right teacher. 
don't get stuck with everybody who says I'm a Lama, I'm a teacher, that I already mentioned, I don't want to repeat. <laughs> so the text he read is basically visualizing the Tsongkhaba in this case. Tsongkhaba, whose text, interesting coincidence, whose text we are studying. Right? O auspicious coincidence. And yesterday I recited these four lines about Tsongkhapa, saying that he is embodiment of all the three deities, which is he also briefly mentioned. So, so what you 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 are doing by reciting these lines, which His Holiness this read read this morning, was basically, you know, you you show your guru devotion first by and in front of you visualize Tsongkhapa, and then in front of him, you you perform this, what we call a seven limb practice, seven branched practices. First you make prostration, pay homage to Tsongkhapa, where the, where the lines read, your minds of wisdom, your minds of wisdom realize the full extent of objects of knowledge. I think I can read without a spectacular. <laughs> your minds of wisdom realize the full extent of objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is the ear ornament of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies are ablaze with the glory of renown. I prostrate to you, whom to see, to hear, and to remember is so meaningful. Making prostration. Meaning of prostration, homage, I already explained yesterday, right? Practice of humility and so forth. Second is making offerings. Pleasing water offerings, various flowers, sweet smelling incense, lights, scented water and so forth. A vast cloud of offerings, both set out and imagined, I offer to you, supreme field of merit. Now here also I'm sure you can see this offerings of water bowls, right? Do you see? Water bowls. This, this came from Indian tradition. If you watch some of the uh, old Indian documentaries, you can st still see such kind of treatment uh, that is made to the king. In there being a hot climate, normally you have seven bowls of water, right? So in there being hot climate, when you receive important guest or any guest, then uh, they first of all, they give some water to drink. Even before entering the room, they give some water to drink, one bowl water. Then one another water to wash the feet. You don't just go in with your smelly feet, you know, you wash your feet. And then when the guest is inside, in front of the table where the guest is sitting, there is flower offering. And then you don't give your room a smelly room, therefore you burn some incense. Then you don't keep your guest in a dark room with no light. <laughs> so therefore, butter, butter lamb offering or this kind of lamb whatever offering. And then, with the kings and important guests, you also sprinkle some scented water. And then, after doing all this, you don't keep your guest hungry, right? So therefore, food offering. Then after that, some people even make musical offering, songs and dances. So this is represented by this, what, five, seven. Uh, it has many representations, but this is one way of understanding it. So if you make an elaborate offering, then instead of these seven bowls of water, first, as I said, is for drinking water, of, of course. The second is washing feet, water. And the third, flour. You put some grains and then on top of it you put flour. Or then next you put some grain and then stick some incense. Then butter lamp. Then water and put some saffron and other scents. And then Food means the Tibetan monks, they prepare very nice kind of torma, they call it, a ritual kind of cake. But that is not a must. You put any food, 
especially nice tinned food or fresh biscuits or fruits, things like that you can make offering. And then some musical instrument. So normally for easier sake, you know, they just make the water offering. And uh, the great Indian teacher, Bengali teacher, Atisha, when he visited Tibet, he said, you Tibetans are so lucky because you have such, such a pure water to offer to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And the advantage of making water offering is you may have to work a little bit, otherwise you will, you will not be thrifty about it. But if you make, you know, offering of milk and something like that, so in the beginning you will make the milk offering, you seem to be okay, but then finally when you make your breakfast and uh, you realize that you need milk, <laughs> you might take it down, you see. <laughs> or you might, oh, I should never offer this, I have to eat this one. <laughs> Right? So you develop some kind of stinginess. So if you make just water offering, there's no feeling of stinginess, grasping. So there's, there's a lot of advantage. <laughs> then also with the, with the butter lamb offerings, you need to use your common sense. Normally we make, you know, make the, prepare the wigs and put real butter and offer it. And then sometimes this attracts butterflies and moths and other flies, they die. Many of them die there. So when you see such a situation, then you should not make such a butter offering. Instead, electric lamb offering. You need to use your common sense. But some people, unfortunately, they, they think that, yes, I made this great offering and they doesn't care who is dying there. Should not do that. Or you make butter lamb offering, but it should be protected by some glasses and things like that. So, the, the, the main purpose of Buddhist teaching is not to harm other sentient beings. So you should, whatever you do, make sure that it's not harming others. Don't, don't be just satisfied and proud with your offerings without seeing other, you know, harms. Okay, offering. Offering is very important. Offering, giving, these are important. We are normally very good in taking, receiving from others. Not good in giving back. <laughs> this is not something unique with us. There was one Tibetan teacher who became very great practitioner, but in the beginning he was also very stingy, like, like many of us. So he realized that he's very stingy and he wanted to practice giving. So what he did was still he was not ready to give anything to others. So he said, okay, let us take something in the right hand and give it to my left hand. Anyway, it comes to me. <laughs> but mentally he was training. So gradually he was not only able to give, but he became a great practitioner, you know, things like that. Then there was another teacher, you know, look at this, the, 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 the real practice. There was another teacher who, who knew one of his benefactors, sponsor is coming to visit him in the hermit or I, I don't know, house or whatever. So he got up and meet, you know, made a very beautiful, elaborate offering. Then after having made all this offering, he realized, why, why I am so, you know, hard working today <laughs> in terms of making offerings? He realized it was not with a good motivation. He was doing this because the sponsor is coming. And then he said, this is a wrong motivation. Then he took a handful of ash, threw it on those offerings. And he said, this is to the mouth of the self-grasping. <laughs> See, so we need to do real practice, real practice. Real practice means no duplicity. Whether people are watching you or not watching you, practice it. Normally what we do is, when many people are watching, we feel a little bit inspired, whatever, you know, we do. For example, you'll see many people going around the temple, paying, you know, prostration, homage and things like that. It is good. But there may be, there may be <laughs> small inkling of showing what you are doing. 
right? You feel like doing those things when many people are there, meaning that, yeah, other people are watching me, see how good I am practicing. The real practice must be done when nobody is watching. In the monasteries also there are stories of one or two very strange monks in the South India right now. There was one senior monk, he would always make sarcastic remarks to all those people who are studying and who are supposed to be practicing and who are also good scholars. So one day he said, one, one day he was watching the monks going for the debating session. Then, uh, then he said, yeah, this, all these people are going there to put water on cement. You know, putting water on cement, when you put water on cement, it becomes harder and harder. So they are going to study so that they make their self-cherishing attitude, <laughs> self-grasping attitude stronger. It is true to some extent. Because when you get more knowledge, you become more arrogant. So, so practice is not easy. Practice is not easy. All right? And uh, then one day, somebody pushed him. Very hard, probably, teasing or whatever. Then later on he said, somebody really, without any need, he pushed me very strongly. But I did not get angry. Then I thought, why I did not get angry? Then I realized, oh, I did not get angry because I did not study Dharma. <laughs> See? He's giving very good lessons. And he never shows he's studying or reading books. But when he closes his room, then he studies. People, people have been watching him, what he's doing. As soon as somebody comes, he immediately closes the book and sit there. <laughs> <laughs> so that you may don't you may not have to do like that, but you know the important thing is you need to practice. I mean, it's like eating food. You will eat food whether others are watching you or not. When I was eating my lunch, nobody was watching me. <laughs> I have to eat. I ate it. So similarly, <laughs> spiritual practice also. It's a, it's a food for the mind, so you have to you have to do it whether somebody is watching you or not watching you. Yes, sometimes with good motivation, you show it so that others get inspired. So it all depends upon your motivation and things like that, right? So the next is next of the seven branch practices: declaration. Whatever non-virtues of body, speech, and mind I have accumulated since time without beginning, especially transgressions of my three levels of vows, with great remorse, I declare each one from the depth of my heart. So declaration means opening up, opening up or showing. For example, if you made a mistake, then show it. Don't hide it. I mean, not, not necessarily showing it to everybody, but before the Lama or wherever it is relevant. Confess it. That's the meaning. Declare it means confess it. Whatever non-virtues of body, speech and mind I have accumulated since time without beginning, not only this life, in the past life also I've done many things. So I, I'm confessing it. Regret it. As Milareva says, if you are thinking about how to purify negative deeds, confess it. If you confess it, it gets purified, right? Especially transgressions of my three levels of vows. Especially transgressions of my three levels of vows means when we talk about committing negative deeds, there are two types of negative deeds. One, natural negative deeds. For example, killing. You know, killing. Those people without vow, killing is done by people without vow or with vow, killing is bad. So this is called natural negative deeds. 
Then natural neg uh, negative deeds due to certain vows. For example, if I say I'm a monk, then I take certain vows, which if I violate it, for me this is a transgression. If you have not taken this vow, it's not transgression for you. <laughs> right? So, so now vows, there are, you know, Parthi Moksha vows, Bodhisattva vows, and uh, Tantric vows. Right? So, so we should be, if you want to take some vows, be careful whether you can observe the precepts. Sometimes we are brave in taking the vows, precepts, but not good in observing it. So, with great remorse, so that's the point, with great remorse, as if you have swallowed poison, with great remorse, I declare each one from the depth of my heart. Just like, just like somebody that has swallowed poison. If you have taken poison, you will not just remain relaxed. You will immediately go to rush to the hospital, ask people how to take it out, things like that. So these negative emotions, are especially the three negative emotions, ignorance, hatred, attachment, these are called poisons. They harm you more than the actual poison. Actual poison may kill you physically, but violation of these negative deeds will bring suffering continuously in this life for many lives to come. Then the next thing that you need to do is rejoicing. In this degenerate age, you strove for much learning and accomplishment, Tsongkhaba. You mean Tsongkhaba. In this degenerate age, you strove for much learning and accomplishment, abandoning the eight worldly concerns. You made your leisure and endowment meaningful. Protect from the very depth of my heart. Protector from the depth, depth of my, from the very depths of my mind. I rejoice in the great wave of your deeds. So Tsongkhaba, as His Holiness mentioned this morning, you know, undertook so much hardship in terms of spiritual uh, realization. Now, now his biographies are also available in English if you read it. You know, it's really like somebody who really studied and practiced both. And he's especially in this degenerate age. Now, now look at his holiness, Dalai Lama. Even more degenerate age even more difficult to practice because there's so much distractions. And His Holiness this, this morning said, I really worked very hard to protect Dharma. And uh, you should also work very hard. That's, that, that was his, one of the main messages. Abandoning the eight worldly concerns. Eight worldly concerns means somebody praises you, you feel happy. Somebody defames you, you feel unhappy, you should not be like that. Somebody says nice words, you feel happy. Somebody says bad words, you feel unhappy. Huh? So at worldly concerns. Worldly concerns. Somebody praises you, somebody says you are a Buddha, you will not become Buddha. Somebody says you, you are a dog, you don't have to <laughs> bark. <laughs> Right? You know. And when you hear good news, you feel happy. When you hear bad news, you feel very unhappy. Right? So in life, understand everything. Equalizing, we call it equalizing everything. This is just a word, these things happen, you know. Today you hear good news, tomorrow bad news is waiting. Today you hear bad news, tomorrow good news is waiting. So you will feel sad, but don't, don't feel too dejected. You will feel happy, but don't get too excited. Don't don't explode. Right? Too much excitement, too much sadness is not good. Little bit, okay, understand it. <laughs> right? Okay. From the very depths of my heart, I rejoice in the great wave of your deeds. Rejoice. This is a very important practice. If you are no, uh, not able to do much practice, but still, if you see other people doing good practice, then rejoice. You just relax, you know. 
and watch other people doing good things and then say, wow, wonderful, very good, very good. You earn similar kind of merit. <laughs> so so, you, so you, you need to know how to do Dharma practice. You need to know. There is a one stanza uh, where it says, the sins committed by the learned ones, even if it is a heavy sin, it will become light. The sins committed by fools, even if it is a light sin, it will become heavy. Example given is like one kilo of, say, one kilo of iron. If you make it a ball and then put it in the water, it will go down, it will sink. If the same iron ball, if you flatten it, it will float on the water, it will not sink. So, so the, the, the learned ones, they know how they commit sins, but they know how to purify it, so it becomes light. Right? So in this context, I'll ask you a question, okay? Which one is heavier? One kilo of iron and one kilo of cotton? Huh? One kilo? Yeah, this is a joke. <laughs> somebody, somebody said, which one is heavier? He said, same. One kilo, right? Then he said, okay, you, you stand down. First I will throw on your head one <laughs> iron. <laughs> then, then, then the cotton, then you will know which one is heavier. <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> this is a joke. Okay, rejoicing. It's very important. <laughs> rejoicing. Rejoicing not only the good deeds of great beings, but especially rejoice at the good deeds done by people who are more, more weak, more, more vulnerable. If Buddha is doing something good, it's good, but it's understandable. He has such a state, right? It's, it's like appreciating you know, small children being able to walk. Elderly people, they're all walking, jump, jumping, dancing. I mean, no, no wonder. But when small kids start walking, we all feel happy and uh, encouraged. Right? It's like that. Okay? Then, request for Dharma teachings. Now, to such a great being, learned and good practitioner, it is a shame if you are unable to receive teachings from such person. And the, the real great teachers don't announce their achievement, their knowledge, as, as we I already told about Buddha, he had to be requested several times to give the teaching. He was very reluctant. So similarly, the real great teachers, their focus is on their personal practice, not so, so much about meeting people and teaching. So you need to approach, request them to give the teaching. That's, that's important. And in the Buddhist teaching also it says, generally speaking, don't teach when you are not requested. But these days, because of time of degeneration, <laughs> some may have good motivation, but many, many of them just announcing, you know, come, I have this great teaching, liberation in one week. <laughs> right? Hindi me, Hindi me bolta hai na? Ram nam japna, primal apna. So, request for Dharma teachings. From the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion, in the space of your enlightened minds, venerable and holy gurus, please send down a rain of vast and profound Dharma teachings. Just like rains come from cloud. So please shower upon us your Dharma teaching, rain of your Dharma teachings. Appropriate to the disciples of this world, appropriate. <clears throat> you may be highly realized, but you cannot teach everything to everybody. So in my case also, when I'm giving this talk, I, I have to make this attempt that I'm saying something that people can understand. I cannot use complicated philosophical terms and uh, go in the traditional line. You know, you may not, many of you may be completely new, so you will not be able to understand it. So that, this is what he's saying, appropriate to the disciples of this world. <sighs> then the next is, request to remain. That means request not to die, not to pass away, because these people are important. 
May your Vajra body, created from the purity of clear light, free of the rising and setting of your cycle existence, but visible to the ordinary viewer only in its unsubtle physical form, stay on unchanging without waning until samsara ends. So this means in reality you have achieved this Vajra body from the pure clear light mind, so you have no death, but you have appeared among us like other ordinary human being. So you may also act and sh you know, show us that, that you are also passing away, you are also dying. So you need to make this request. So that's why now Tibetan people are these days making so many long life offerings to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know. All Tibetan organizations, you know, schools, uh, teachers, uh, ex staffs whatever, you know, in June, 500, 600 people are coming from different parts of the world to make long life offering. It's, it's like, almost like very tiring to His Holiness, whatever, but you can see the devotion, the idea behind. So this, this point also is important for you to have some understanding. Once I was giving some talks to Tibetans in Switzerland, then somebody out of the curiosity asked me, how does this long life request, you know, long life offerings work? Because if you don't understand, then you might think this is just all show. Some people are requesting live long, then the Lama accepts that I'll live long, you know. How does this work? Then I give an example by saying, okay, take the example of your, your family members. Okay. So among the family members, let us say the husband and wife, they are very harmonious, love each other. And let us say the husband goes to work, nine to five job. The wife lives in the house, householder. And if they have much love towards each other, right? As soon as the, the work finishes, the husband, as soon as the work finishes, he will immediately run to home, thinking that my wife is waiting, my children are waiting, right? And the wife also feels very happy. She has nothing to complain. Right? So therefore, this contrib contributes towards their long life. This is how it works. So when we make this long life offering, you know, we are also saying, Your Holiness, you are so important. We love you. You know, please take care of your health. This is what we ordinarily also say. But here it's totally different, much more powerful. <laughs> right? So, so, so that makes His Holiness also say, okay, I'll live more than 110 years, which He repeatedly said this morning also. In fact, for your kind knowledge, there is a text written 200 years back by a Tibetan, great, very famous Tibetan teacher, who had made a prophecy about this 14th Dalai Lama, which year he will be born, that his name will start from Tenzing, that he will, you know, uh, make Dharma flourish in all over the Tibet. He will visit all over the world. All those things. More than half a page, this loose, long folios, more than half a page. I've read it. And there it says he will live 113 years. This is a prophecy. And later on, His Holiness also said, yeah, once I was, he was, he, I remember he, during many of his teachings, he was praising this great teacher. Nyingmapa teacher. And one day he said, he was reading the text, and then he said, what? Is this about me? <laughs> and then later on he had few dreams showing that he will live 113 years. Okay, this is the prophecy and what his holiness is saying, but, there is a but. This is also dependent upon how much merit we accumulate, how much fortune we have, right? Which you may not understand. Unlucky, you know, oh, my father passed away so soon, I'm unlucky, that's what we say. If you're lucky, <laughs> if you have the fortune, uh, then the Lama will also live longer. Again, in this context, let, let us start, again go back to the family. <laughs> the husband and wife, as I said earlier. If they are really taking good care of each other, they don't want to die. They want to live. Right? 
So it, it should not be just making some offerings. It is primarily what you do in your daily life, how much you are following what His Holiness has taught, which is called collecting merit means doing good things, accumulating good things. So that positive energy also contributes to the long life of the Lama, your life, etc. Okay. So making such request is also very important. Not only during a big gathering, but in your daily life and prayer, uh, uh, make such wishes for the long life of not only His Holiness, but all the great teachers of all the religions, long life all, of all the good people. What about bad people? <laughs> bad people, they say, may the bad people have short life. Because it will be only destructive for everybody, <laughs> not much use. <laughs> anyway, so request to remain long. Then finally, dedication. Through the virtues I have accumulated here, may the teachings and all living beings receive every benefit, especially may the essence of the teaching of Lama Jetsongkhapa shine forever. So that means dedication is very important. Dedication is like putting the putting your money in the bank. There is a difference between putting the money in your house or putting the money in the bank. If you put the money in the bank, not necessarily all countries, some countries don't have any interest. <laughs> but some countries, if you put money in the bank, you get quite good interest. Or at least there may be. These days I don't know, but generally, maybe more security, right? Supposed to be. So anyway, uh, Even if you do like 10 minutes prayer, at the end of that prayer you should dedicate it, meaning that whatever virtue they have earned through this practice, may this become a cause to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. If you dedicate it, it is really like putting, putting in a safe cave, safe keep, and it will not be lost. If it is not, you know, dedicated, then you may have done something good, but next moment you get angry, and all the good works are destroyed. That's what the text says. Okay. This copy, I give it to you. Right away. <laughs> yeah. You can actually, anybody who's interested, you can download from the internet. Very easy. But the page is a little bit different. One, two. Okay, so let us go back to our text. Page, page 11, page 11. <clears throat> Need to generate the determination to be free. You got it? Without a pure determination to be free, there is no means to achieve peace. Due to fixation upon the pleasurable effects of the ocean of existence, embodied beings are thoroughly bound by craving for existence. Therefore, in the beginning, seek a determination to be free. Determination to be free means renunciation. Because without pure determination to be free, meaning without renunciation, there is no means to achieve peace. Peace here means nirvan. Meaning that if you have, as I have already given you the example, if you have not seen the limitation, the problem, the difficulties, you will never make a move. Right? So therefore it is important to see the limitation, the life itself, the countless faults that we have fragilities that we have, right? So don't cling, don't get obsessed with this ephemeral, you know, things, right? So the more and more you understand the limitation of your life and whatever you're experiencing due to negative emotions and wrong actions, when you see this, Clearly, then you will develop this 
genuine determination to be free, wish to come out from samsara, that is called renunciation. And if you don't have that, it is impossible to develop this drive to achieve liberation. For example, we are all scared of death, right? Are you scared of death? Yes. yes. Which means you want to stay in the samsara? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is yes, kind of yes. So when you say, I'm, I'm scared of death, what you're saying is, I want to continue to stay. Where? In the samsara. Clearly showing, clearly showing that we have not seen the shortcomings, drawbacks, limitations of the samsara. We are thinking samsara so far is quite good. Right? We are almost like those small kids who are so attached to their toys. Toys, newly bought toys. These plastic toys that children play with, for them this is very enjoyable, you know. If somebody breaks their toy, they will weep, cry, kick their feet. But from the purview of a grown-up people like us, we say, oh, this is just plastic toy, why are you why you're crying? So similarly, those things that we experience in samsara, where we get obsessed and we think this is amazing, you know, this mobile phone 15, 16 is amazing, this Mercedes car is amazing, things like that. But if you look closely, Yes, you can use it as a toy, you can use it. We do use the word toy, this is my toy, right? But if you really think carefully, you know, for example, say the Mercedes car. Once it is prepared, it looks very nice, but if you go to the factory where it is prepared, it's all assembling of different pieces of <laughs> iron or whatever, you know, things like that. So this is a bigger toy. So we get obsessed with these things. We get so obsessed with these things that we fight for these things. We're ready to die for those things, for property, for wealth. Family members kill each other these days. Right? Have anybody read this book by Robin Sharma? Who will cry when you die? He is a CEO, very eloquent, has written many books. So I, I read this book, Who Will Cry When You Die? So there he talks about these things. He, he tells this story of somebody who bought a brand new car, brand new car. And uh, when, when we fancy something, you know how much hard we have to work. For example, if you are really looking for a car, the car is costly, you won't get it like that, right? And then you just, just touch your pocket and parts and see how much money is there. Oh no, I need to work hard. Then work, 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 and then you collect money. If it, now, now look at how human mind functions. Even before you bought the car, because you have this passion, even before you bought the car, when you do the window shopping, <laughs> where the car is kept, already the car looks nice. You have not owned it, but still it looks nice. The more and more you start collecting money, and the more you more visit, the car looks even more nicer, you know. And then finally you bought it, and you have it, you're over the moon, you know. I made it, I have this car, oh my goodness, I can't go to bed quickly, I have to go and see it several times. That's what we do even with the mobile phone, right? So this gentleman, in this story by Robin Sharma, this gentleman bought such a car with all the stories that I've told you. So he was, he was so attached to this car, especially during the honeymoon period. That's what we all do. 
So for the first few, few days, he makes sure that the car doesn't collect dust. He covers it and he makes sure nobody touches it. <laughs> so he had a small daughter. This innocent small daughter goes there and uh, writes something on the brand new car. The father, with his attachment to the car, was furious and pushes the little girl. What are you doing? He didn't mean to kill the little girl, but because he pushed it, she fell down and she dies. This is not a real story, don't worry. <laughs> but we can do that, we can do that. So now he had already killed the little daughter. There's nothing he can do. The only thing he can do is what she has written on the car. Goes back to the car and sees what she has written. She has written, Papa, I love you. Doubly shocking, right? This, this will happen if we have so much you know, craving and grasping attachment. This is what I'm saying. So therefore, therefore it is important this, this line is important. Without a pure determination to be free, when you have not seen the essencelessness of all our accumulations, material accumulations, accumulations of accolades, name, fame, whatever, <laughs> if you don't see the essencelessness of many of these things, then there is no means to strive for long-lasting peace, nirvana, liberation. Why? Because due to fixation upon the pleasurable effects of the ocean of existence, due to the fixation, <laughs> this is a good word, fixation upon the pleasurable effects, in, in, eat a chocolate, pleasurable effect. Go for a swimming, pleasurable effects. And many, many pleasure effects in this ocean of existence. Because, as I mentioned earlier, he's saying that because of our fixation to the sensual objects, from where you get some fleeting pleasures, embodied beings, means us human beings, who have this physical body, embodied beings, not only human beings, but other sentient beings also, embodied beings are thoroughly bound by craving for existence, thoroughly bound. You get stuck. You get stuck in this craving for, as I mentioned earlier. We are all busy, we are all running because of this fixation, craving, craving. Therefore, in the beginning, seek a determination to be free. Renunciation is very important. Renunciation means see the essenceless and limitation of many of the things we do. Kokla, than Hindi me, kokla. Koklapan. Oh. Okay. Things look good from a distance, but if you really see, explore, there's not much essence there. So develop this determination, strong determination to be free. Then, page 26. There's also a verse on page 12. Huh? There's also a verse on page 12. Page what? 12. 12. No, they're not that one. Huh? Yes, 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 you are right. You are right, you are. Thank you, thank you. Page 12, yeah, page 12. <coughs> now, you are asked to develop this genuine determination to be free. So, here you need to know in which area you are obsessed. You are either obsessed for the pleasures of this life, 
or you are obsessed with pleasures of the future life. Okay. So contemplating how freedom and fortune, fortune are difficult to find. Meaning that contemplating means thinking how this precious human life is difficult to find. And that in life there is no time to waste blocks the attraction to captivating appearance of this life. Captivating appearances of this life. Because of the seemingly goodness of this life, captivating appearances, not in reality. Because of this attract, attractive, attract, attraction to captivating appearance of this life, you waste your life. But if you think properly, the meaning of this precious human life, where there is freedom, where there is opportunity, and that it is difficult to find, right? Then you will be able to know there is no time for me to waste. It's a shame to waste my time for such small, you know, hollow things, essentialness things. So that will develop, that will help you block the attraction to this life or obsession to this life. Now, even if you stop this obsession to this life, you might develop some uh, obsession to the next life, thinking that may I be born as a god, as a human being in the next life. There's also obsession. So therefore, the next line says, repeatedly contemplating actions and infallible effects and the sufferings of cycle existence blocks the captivating appearance of the future lives, means that when we talk about developing renunciation, develop this renunciation, of, you know, coming out from the samsara. Not only this life, in the future lives also, if you are within the samsara, you have the same suffering, you have the same problem, right? So therefore, therefore, you should think about the infallible effects, Me meaning that if you do good, you, you have good. If you do bad things, you will have bad results. There is no cheating, okay? You can cheat other people, you can't cheat. You can't cheat. the law of karma. This is important. For example, if you do something, this is, this, is, this is what is said in Buddhism. For example, if you do something, or think something, positive and negative, people may know, not know about it. People may not know about it. But an imprint is left on your mind. Which, in the passage of time, give fruition. The clearest example that I can give is if you record something on your mobile phone now, earlier tape, you know, with you know cassette tapes. Now if you record something on the cassette tape, you record two things. First you record uh, a beautiful song. After that, you record two people fighting and shouting each other, shouting each other, fighting at each other, or killing, or, or maybe weeping, or crying. Record that. After having recorded it, you, you just look at the ribbon of the cassette. Can you see? Can you see the song? Especially on the mobile phone, you don't see anything now. In the cassette, at least you see the ribbon. <laughs> It's becoming more complicated, you see. So what we live, you know, the imprint that we live on the mind is like that. So if you look at the, the ribbon, you don't see anything. But that doesn't mean the song is not recorded. That doesn't mean the shouting, crying is not recorded. In order to know that, what you have to do is put that cassette back into this player, record player, and play and push the play button. And what will you hear? You will hear whatever you have recorded. <laughs> if you recorded a song, you can see here, listen to this beautiful song and be happy. If you have recorded, you know, fighting and shouting, yelling, you will hear that and you also feel unhappy. So it is like that. So that's what I'm saying, there's no cheating. Right? And the sufferings of cyclic existence blocks the captivating appearance. Captivating appearance. Yeah, from a distance everything looks nice. 
right? Especially we de decorated it. This temple also looks so nice. So many beautiful paintings, things like that. <laughs> but in reality, in essence, there's nothing. But we get stuck with this appearances. Appearances are deceptive, very deceptive. So don't get stuck with the appearance, but go to the reality. Okay? Measure of having now, page 26, 7. Yeah, there's another one? Oh, what am I doing today? What? Twenty-one. Yeah, if you think repeatedly about the infallible law of actions and results. Now this is, I think, the same that we have read earlier. Repeatedly, repeatedly contemplate actions, infallible effects, and the sufferings of cycle existence blocks the captivating. So I think this we have already read. So this is again repeating the same thing. Okay. So page 27, right? Yeah, 27. The measure of having generated a determination to be free. So this is basically saying, how do we know that I have developed this mind of renunciation? How do I know? We, will, we all will say that it is good to develop renunciation, but how will I know that I have developed that renunciation? So therefore the next verse explains how to gauge whether you have generated a determination to be free of cycle existence. Having familiarized ourselves in this way, if you do not generate admiration for the prosperity of cycle existence, even for an instant, and if you wish for liberation day and night, at that time you have generated the determination to be free. So difficult, right? Having familiarized ourselves in this way, if you do not generate admiration for the good things of the cycle existence, even for an instant, Wow, <laughs> so difficult, so difficult. And I'm, I'm saying this is so difficult based on my own experience. Before I was His Holiness's translator, I, I, I had a really good time to listen to his teaching. And especially in those days, His Holiness teaching was of course a real teaching. You know, it will be at least like three, four sessions, each session maybe two hours. Very elaborate teaching. So I used to attend those teachings, take my notebook, take, take the, the text that His Holiness is teaching, then I read it and take note and so inspired, and so moved. And then I start thinking, oh, I must do something. I must practice renunciation. This is so important. Oh, I will do it. How long that, how long that determination lasts, you know? As soon as the teaching finishes, and the, and the steps, steps outside the, the door of the temple, and join the rest of the big gathering, it is really like saying, welcome back to the familiar world. <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> Believe me, this is my experience, you know. And I did not make any progress, still maybe like that. These days I don't go to this all this teaching, I just watch it online. Because I had enough, you know, pushing and pulling with the crowd, so. <laughs> so, so but even if I go, I think it will be more or less the same. It's a die-hard habit, it's not easy. But I'm not discouraging you. That doesn't mean you will not get any benefit. Yes, you do get benefit. You may have problems, when you have difficulties, you have something to pull out. Yes, this is it. Okay, no problem. Some tragedy happens, okay. 
this is what the teaching says okay no problem like that it really really helps you so you know although it is difficult don't say it is difficult just continue to do so and it will be very impactful in your life right so for the prosperity of cyclic existence, even for an instant and if you wish and if you wish for liberation day and night <laughs> my god wish for liberation may i become buddha may i become <laughs> May I achieve liberation? May I achieve day and night? Forget about day and night. If you are able to recall that at least two, three times in a day, <laughs> it's amazing, right? Not easy. Again, I'm not saying it is impossible. It's all question of repeatedly doing something. If you repeatedly do something, you will be able to do it, right? So therefore, this His Holiness teaching is so useful. You know, occasionally when His Holiness gives the teaching, then at least during those teachings I have to, you know, I was not attending the teaching as I said, but I was reading the commentaries of, written by great teachers about the same teaching that is going to give, and then I listen to His Holiness teachings, things like that. So it helps you when you meet great teachers. It helps you. So you need to keep in touch with such practices again and again. Keep good books. Now, luckily these days, there are so many online teachings. Even His Holiness's old online teachings. Especially listen to some of the old online teachings. There, there is plenty. There is a plenty. Right? So, and if you wish for liberation day and night, at that time you have generated the determination to be free. The reason I'm saying it is possible is, for example, for example, if you're not like, if you're living in a particular place, in a particular family, and the family members are not at all good to you, they are mistreating you, you know, and on the other side of the world, you have another family who really loves you and, and is very, really good. Then now, because of this bad experience that you are having with this family, <laughs> day and night, Day and night you will think about leaving this family and joining that other family. So, so it is possible. It's possible. It's possible only when you realize, as I said, the suffering, the, the problem, the limitation, when you have properly understood it, then the longing will come. If it is not there, then the longing will not be there. Right? So it's possible. Okay, any questions? Question answer session. Yeah. Hello, Geshala. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I I had one question regarding. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I had one question regarding fixation. Yeah. That you were talking about earlier. Yeah. yeah. So, I agree with you that we need to give up fixation mm. to achieve nirvana. Mm. But doesn't fixation sometimes lead to great innovations? that craziness in a person maybe leads them to be successful in a specific area which is different from what we are striving to do. Mm. So if I want to devote my life or towards the philosophy of what we are studying today, yeah. is it possible that it will stop me from achieving? Like maybe I, I, I may not strive to work very hard in something that I was doing earlier and I devote my life into this. Will it stop me to achieve something in that area? I mean, how do I balance everything? Just As I said yesterday, 50-50. 50-50 means that uh, we are just talking about this great goal, desired goal, but we are not saying that everybody will be able to go towards that. We are not saying just you, you know, concentrate only on spiritual practice, give up your family, get divorced, 
we are not at all saying that. Instead, we are saying live nicely with your family. <laughs> Almost like saying continue to develop attachment. <laughs> but uh, so, you, you, with, with this, you, you need to develop this understanding that you are still an ordinary human being. And you have a body to look after, you have a mind to look after. For your body, you need a proper job. But that is not enough for the long run for your mental happiness. So therefore you need to uh, do spiritual practice also. So it, there should be balance. And gradually when your spiritual realization increases and you also don't have to worry much about your financial you know, income, then you can devote more on spiritual practice. Otherwise, yes, this is a very good question because some people, they in the initial stage, they get so excited, yes, I will do Dharma practice, you know, I want to become a nun, I want to become a monk, you know. And then for the first few days, their, their behavior also like very quiet, you know, moves like this, you know. Don't talk to people, looks very nice. And they become a monk and nun, then after a few days, they go back to the same life. Things are not easy. We have to plan, think, plan and think carefully and be realistic. Be realistic. That's important. And then also like, uh, for example, the other side, for example, if you have this opportunity to really excel in a particular, you know, uh, academic field or technological field, if there, there is a possibility for you to rise higher and uh, start a big company and get a lot of money, you know, if you are talking things like that. That is, that is the worldly way of achieving success. So again, we are not saying don't do that. You can rise high and you can become a boss of a big company, you become a billionaire, millionaire, whatever. And uh, that is not necessarily bad. It may be very good, provided if you use that, that talent, that achievement, for the greater good, then it's okay. Otherwise, it's just for feeding your ego. You become billionaire. What are you going to do? Okay, you you buy two uh, two thousand Mercedes car and things like that. I don't even know the names of all those cars now. Right? And then you have like uh, I've seen this like in many places. If you travel around the world, some of the rich people they have. Uh, uh, almost like five-star hotel near the beach in, in almost all the countries. I visited some of them. They spend in a year, maybe one week maximum, visit that place. Otherwise, it's, it's used by the caretakers and servants and things like that. So, what is the benefit? And from my point of view, but I have to be honest, you know, they may have many good reasons to do that. <laughs> but from my point of view, there's not much benefit. And some of them own a whole island. It's, I visited those also. Right? <laughs> right? So that's what I'm saying. So it depends, whatever you do, you know. And in, Buddhi in Buddhism, especially in the Mahayana practice, in the Bodhisattva in the practice, it never says you become poor. It never says you don't become rich. The, in fact, there is a line in the Madhimika Avatara which says, Minam Devang Lungju Me Mila, which means human, the well being of human beings cannot be there without property, without wealth. And wealth comes from giving, not just collecting, collecting, collecting. By giving. Right? So therefore, I think there should be a middle way or balanced approach. Take good care of your health, no problem if you're becoming rich, but don't think this is the end of the story because very soon you will collapse. So, like that. Okay, next question. Yeah? Thank you, Keshela, for mm. coming to teach us. Mm. Um, in our discussion group yesterday, mm. we were talking about the path of the Bodhisattva, mm. and 
we had some confusion when we were talking about Theravada Buddhism mm -hmm. versus Mahayana, mm -hmm. and there was some confusion about the terms of Arhant and mm -hmm. Bodhisattva mm -hmm. and Buddha, mm -hmm. and also about different terms like Nirvana, enlightenment, mm -hmm. moksha. Mm -hmm. I've even read the word Mahasiddha before mm -hmm. when talking about mm -hmm. some of the tantric masters mm -hmm. in Tibetan Buddhism like mm -hmm. Tilopa. Mm -hmm. um, can you help shed some light on the meaning of these different terms and if um, in particular, I'm curious about Arahant, the Arahant ideal of the Theravada path versus Bodhisattva and Buddha mm -hmm. in Mahayana Buddhism. This is a good question. <clears throat> Earlier, we used the term Hinayana and Mahayana. The word itself may not be derogatory. It is found in the Sutra, in the text. But in our Modern society, if you use such word, it may be derogatory. Hin means small. Hinayana means small vehicle, small path. Mahayana means the greater path. So Theravada is called Hinayana or smaller vehicle, which may for many people look like a derogatory term. But in the Buddha's teaching, he is not talking about, you know, he is not using this word, you know, towards a particular country. He is using this in terms of uh, practitioners, people who practice. So people who practice the Dharma, they practice simply for their own purpose to achieve liberation, even liberation, nirvana, just for themselves. That's called Hinayana. Your thinking is small. So Mahayana means one who, as I said, aspires, may I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, is a big thinking about all sentient beings. So that's Mahayana in that sense. But unfortunately, sometimes this is applied to a specific country, you know. Then this may become like a derogatory term. So, so now we, therefore, now we don't use that. We try to use Theravad, which means the teaching of the elders. And the Bodhisattvayana means the, the path and practice of the Bodhisattvas. Okay? So both in the Theravada teaching and in the Bodhisattvayana teaching, the word Arhat is mentioned. Arihant or Arhat. Even even in Jainism they use the word Arihant. I don't know the meaning may be same. But anyway, in Theravada and uh, Bodhisattva we use the word Arhat. Arhat means the the one who had destroyed the enemy. Destroyed the enemy means enemy here is the afflictive emotion. So one who has completely destroyed the negative emotion, that is called Arhat. Sometimes we have translated it as the foe destroyer, the one who destroyed the foe, the enemy destroyer. So there it is same, both the Bodhisattva and uh, uh, Mahayana. The meaning of Arhat means somebody who had destroyed the enemy and who has achieved Nirvana. And now the problem here is many people equate Nirvana with enlightenment, especially the complete Buddhahood or enlightenment. And this English word enlightenment is also very confusing because the word enlightenment is, is just a degree, you know. If you learn something, you say, I, I'm enlightened, you know. So we are not talking about that. We are talking about complete enlightenment. When you become Buddha, then we say you are completely enlightened. So now there may be a person who has achieved arathood, but is still not a Buddha. This, this is the difference. In order to become Buddha, you need to follow the path of the Bodhisattvayana. In order to become an Arhat, you don't have to do that. Your job is to remove the negative emotions. Now, in, when you follow the Bodhisattvayana path, then your job is to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Right? So you become Buddha. When, if you are you're Arhat, doesn't mean you are Buddha. If you are Buddha, definitely you are Arhat also. What other terms? Yeah, moksha means liberation, nirvana, same. Yeah. Same, same. Nirvana is not same, no. Nirvana, nirvana means when you have achieved arathood, you have also achieved nirvana because you are liberated from samsara. But you, are, you may not necessarily still be Buddha. Okay? Huh? Mahasiddha, Mahasiddha, Siddha means, Siddha, Siddha means accomplishment. You do certain tantric practice, then you get certain accomplishment. 
For example, the accomplishment of uh, making yourself invisible. For example, if, if I have achieved certain feet, I can make myself disappear in front of you. Right? So there, there are like uh, eight accomplishments and so forth, which is mentioned in tantric practice. So, so Buddha is in that sense also Mahasiddha, somebody who has really achieved the highest level. Then we have uh, many other practitioners, for example, the 80 Siddhas, they are all highly accomplished Mahasiddhas. So Siddha means something you know, that you have achieved accomplishment, yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. It's working, yeah. Hello. <laughs> uh, thanks for being with us first. <laughs> mm. I have a question. Mm. So I, can, when I can only see your crown. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's enough. <laughs> yes, yes, enough yes. <laughs> um, so when we, lose some, when we lose someone very close, uh, relative, like a parent, yeah. um, we can feel or think they stay with us, their soul continue to protect us. Does it mean that they cannot have their reincarnation, still they, are, they, they stay with us? No, we, use, we don't use the word reincarnation. Again, this is the English term, you know, so I don't know much. But as I said, reincarnation, as we understand right now, is somebody who can come back into this world out of his own choice, not due to negative emotions. So in that case, ordinary people don't reincarnate. So now your parents, whether ordinary person or highly realized, I don't know. If they are highly realized, they can reincarnate. If they are ordinary person, they will they have they have rebirth, but no reincarnation, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you mean to say that there is difference between reincarnation and rebirth? Yes. Rebirth, as I said, all of us will be reborn. There's no choice. When we die, we have to born again. We don't disappear into nothingness. Rebirth will be there. Reincarnation means choice, out of choice. Somebody comes back out of, through, through love, through compassion, through wisdom, like that, yeah. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, many times we get this feeling of, uh, I don't know what it is said in Hindi or like Tibetan culture. In English it is called deja vu feeling. Yeah. That exactly the same moment and the same thing has happened like previously. But yeah. you just get like a glimpse of the thing that like right now in this same room, same question I've asked you. Uh -huh. Like you understand what I'm trying to say? Uh -huh. Yeah, possible. Possible. So what do you say about that? Like uh, no, the possible. I don't. I have heard about this word deja vu, but I don't know exactly what it means. But uh, but I I think I got what you are saying. For example, if you go to Mangalore Ganj market and you meet many people, right? Just out of this many people, some pe some some people you may be meeting for the first time, you, but you develop a feeling. Oh, this this person I met before. You feel like talking to that person. On the other hand, you see some people, you feel like, oh, as we say, bad energy. <laughs> this person has done nothing to you, but don't, you don't feel like approaching or talking to that person. So this is, you know, according to the Buddhism, this is because of your karmic connection. Past lives, karmic habits, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Namaste Keshala. Mm -hmm. um, really grateful finally I have the opportunity of asking you a question. Mm -hmm. So I was reading this book by Zongsa Kense Rinpoche mm -hmm. and uh, it relates to the question I think he asked as well. And one of the parts says that the Buddha warned about categorizing because when there are categories, preferences begin to take root. Inevitably, one category is then considered to be lesser than the others. Mm -hmm. And what he's referring to is the three yanas of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask you is that, does this create separation? 
Do you think that my, my Mahayana is better than Hinayana or... No, as I, as I, as I said, differences are never, you can never say there is no difference. There is a way of saying that all are same. That means a different meaning. For example, when we say, all of us, from the parlance of ultimate nature, shunyata, we are completely same. Your shunyata, my shunyata, the nature is completely same. But that doesn't mean you and I are same. We are different. Right? So, in fact, in fact, it is because of the separateness, we, we can talk about different identities. Otherwise, there, there's no way we can talk about you and I and yellow and black and everything is mixed, you know. So it's important that, in, it's not, it is important to recognize that unique and common identities that each and every object has, each and every individual has. Rang rang la nature, this is from Madhimika. Rang rang la nature, everybody abides in their own identity. And identity means that you have an identity, you have a qualification, which, is, which others don't have. For example, for example, you are not a tree. So your not being tree is your identity. Right? But this, this, there's not much problem, you know, even if you say I'm a tree, there's not a big problem. But in other areas, it can become a big problem. For example, Tibetans are now struggling to maintain our identity, that we are Tibetans, not Chinese. And the Chinese government, people, I would not use the word people, Chinese government is saying Tibetans are Chinese. So now I have to say, okay, no, we are not, we are not Chinese, we have separate identity, we are not Chinese because we don't speak their language, we, we don't know how to read their uh, script, which is ideogram, not like Indian alphabet or Tibetan alphabet, right? And the food habit, everything is different. So therefore we need to clearly show, no, <laughs> here there is a danger, risk, you see. So anyway, whatever be the case, you, you have like millions of identity of not being this, that, that, you know, on one person. But what is the idea of non-separation then? I just wanted to understand. Non-separation, as I, as I said, in terms of a larger picture, that we are all, we all have interconnected reality. <coughs> interconnected. You are a human being, I'm a human being. From that point of same. Right? So there are two ways of seeing things. The conventional ways of seeing things, ultimate ways of seeing things. The conventional, in Buddhism we talk about the conventional truth and ultimate truth. In Sanskrit we call it samvritti satya, pram arth satya. Right? So the, in, the, in the conventional world, in the conventional level of the truth, varieties are there, varieties are important. Varieties provide that richness. Varieties provide that colorful life, right? So many things. So in that conventional level it is good, but the problem is we get stuck with the conventional level, the color, the smell, you know? We get stuck there. And we, we, we are unable to go into the ultimate truth. So therefore the Buddha's teaching says, okay, conventional identity is, conventional truth is the means and ultimate truth is what you get from that means. So transcend that con conventional truth and go into the ultimate truth. When you go into the ultimate truth, there is nothing to hold on to. If you read this Shantideva's, in, in, I think in the Wisdom chapter, he makes a reference with this at worldly concerns, as his holiness <coughs> taught this morning. And then he says, when you, when you enter into this ultimate realm, ultimate truth, there's nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Gain and lose and superior, inferior, all these are th things are there on the conventional level, conventional truth. Right? Okay?
Shall we go to the area? <laughs> you, you, you are the boss, you decide. <laughs> How many questions? Yeah, maybe one here, one here, like that. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Geshila. Mm. Uh, my question is about the, the last verse that we read uh, on the measure of determination to be free. Mm. Uh, it was saying that we should not generate admiration uh, for the good things of this cyclic existence. Mm -hmm. And then also just before um, you were mentioning the importance of rejoicing. Mm. And I'm wondering um, in, in the determination to be free, is there room for appreciating uh, like the beauty you know, of nature, mm. the good qualities of uh, mm. humans like friendship, generosity, even the beauty of um, the desire to achieve a mind of enlightenment. Mm. Mm. So how does this relate and like what is really the meaning of admira admiration? Uh, is it is it re rejoicing? Is it different? Mm. No. So so this is. Uh Yeah, 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 let me answer. Then if that answers your related question, then that is the end of the story, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so very good, very good observation. Because these are problems with the usage of the word. So here, yes, if somebody does good work, admire, admiration must be there. In Buddhism also we say, praise, praise him. He's, he's doing a good job. Pat him on the back, you know, all those things are there. But here, the, the word admiration basically means deep down from within your mind, wow, this is so good, you know, I must have it. Grasping. Yes, grasping. That should not be there. Not, not just uh, not having admiration, yeah. But the word prosperity almost seems like accumulation or wanting things or oh. instead of loving him. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it depends. The, the, the different translators use different words, but here he, we use the word prosperity, and you can also use the word excellencies. Excellencies. Things like that. So I don't know. Perfections or whatever. Worldly perfections, worldly goodness, worldly achievement, you know, different things. <coughs> yeah. Take it. Yeah, mm. Can I do this practice for uh, just one week? Can I have uh, just one massage time at my home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I need to put the Baba Sankarpa in the chair also in my <coughs> No, you can, as he's only said this morning, you can see Lama Tsongkhapa and His Holiness as same emanation. So whichever, yeah. They gave me microphone, so maybe I should ask. Yes, please. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, can, you can do one thing. Take that and run away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, my, said, my I tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, when it was the teaching time, so this Tibetan girl who is the caretaker said, Gishila, time to go. I said, No, I don't want to go. <laughs> she was looking at me. Gishila, time to go. Said, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> then I said, I really remain adamant and did not go. What will you do? She said, I'll pull you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask about like, how should person like make decisions in, in, in his life? Like, 
Um, it's also connected maybe with the searching for a teacher, but like uh, I think more about like really everyday yeah, yeah. things that, uh, you know, for example, you make a plan for things you want to do in like close future, but then like suddenly strange things start to appearing on your path and like it it seems like it's a kind of like a destiny that that you should like grab it or mm -hmm. leave it and if you leave it you are maybe risking that will never appear again and so then it's also the question about like if you believe in intuition or it's no i i would suggest that in all eventualities and contexts use your brain think this is good for me what should i do what should not i do think and plan properly don't don't start anything hurriedly right think carefully whether you can do that project or whether you should go into that direction whatever think carefully is it better to go there is it better to go here whatever you know think carefully then after th having thought carefully if you go there it doesn't mean you will be showered upon with success after success, you know. There may be some, you know, challenges, uh, unexpected situations. Then again, use your brain. How, how, how should I tackle with this problem? Shall I now return back, leave that place, or whatever? Again, think carefully. So always judge and think carefully. And I, I don't think it's a very good idea to say if something unexpected happens, then, oh, this is my destiny, no. Don't do that. Don't don't submit your life to destiny. It may be possible, but but use your brain. We have uh, freedom to choose things. You know, think carefully, and then even if something goes mistake, you know, you have nothing to regret. I thought it carefully; it, it didn't happen. Okay, now I'll discontinue this one. I'll do other one like that okay because you don't have clear points so things unexpected things might happen then when unexpected especially difficult things happen then use that as a learning opportunity learn from that trouble learn from that challenges that is why we say suffering is introduction to happiness and we learn from challenges. But that doesn't mean, you know, I want to learn from challenges and you go before a tiger or lion, no. Right? You, 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 you will not do that because you use your brain. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Yeah, 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 you, you decide. Hello. Um, I just want to, well, I, I wonder how, how do you trust your brain, your mind? Because, um, you know, the mind can be a tricky thing. And, uh, for instance, in my meditation, my mind is all over the place. And then my mind told me that I was observing my mind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just can't get out of the, the maya <laughs> of my own mind. Yeah, so that's why some people say, don't think too much. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think too much. <laughs> you should think, use your mind, but not too much. Over-exercising of everything is not good. You need to do physical exercise. But if you do too much, it will strain all your muscles or, you know, <laughs> break your backbone, whatever, you know. So you, you need to think and then give time, but, but whether you like it or not, most of the time we are thinking. For example, if you come down from, a, from, a, from some steps, you don't just go down without thinking, you know. If you do that, you will fail. So you are, you are thinking, you know. On each and every step you are thinking. So that's good enough, but if you spend too much time thinking, is it better for me to move or not to move, you know? Then there is a hesitation. Then you fall. So that's why, you know, people who teach, especially people who are over 60 like me, they teach you how to, how to walk. Not only babies, how to walk. 
how to climb up the steps. So when you climb up the steps, you need to trust your leg without hesitation. You should say, I can do, no problem. But if you hesitate, oh, maybe I'm 60, now I may not be able to do, you know. Then you are not trusting your leg. And then with this hesitation, there is no more risk of falling down. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So my question is about renunciation mm. and uh, about if it's possible to develop this distaste, distaste for samsara, this absolute distaste and yeah, renunciation, does it need to come through experience or can it also come just from listening to dharma and something more uh, intellectual, let's say, or does it have to be something that we go in through experience and understanding through that? Listening, thinking, meditation, as I said earlier. Listening is important. But that is not enough. You need to think how far this teaching seems true. When you find this teaching is really tr good, you develop the conviction, then you need to practice meditation. So that practice, meditation is the most important thing. If you personally don't experience, don't do meditation, you will not learn much. For example, if you are, let us talk about a very small renunciation of renouncing eating chocolates. Okay, somebody tells you, okay, you are, you are so fond of chocolate, don't eat, it's not good for your you know, health. But if you continue to eat, then very soon you will see the sign of it is, you know, harming your health. Then, then, you are, then you are compelled to reduce eating chocolate. So I'm not saying that you continue to eat chocolate until you get sick, I'm not saying that. But by reflecting and thinking that this will be the consequence of my leading such a way of life. So much in advance you should reduce it with conviction. That's important. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Geshe. Mm. Um, when you spoke at the beginning about the eight worldly concerns, mm. um, about wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, what did you mean by equalize everything as an antidote to that? Equalizing means, as I said, as I already mentioned, if somebody says you are Buddha, don't feel too happy because you are not Buddha. Somebody says, <laughs> you're not a Buddha, you're a dog. <laughs> As I said, you don't have to bark. <laughs> you're not a dog. So equal. You know, whether they say dog or Buddha, what is there? So we get hurt because we pay too much attention to what other people say. The problem in our life is we, we are almost becoming, in Hindi we say, katputli, you know. We are, we are becoming like a puppet. We let other people pull the string and we are simply dancing, you know. If I wear this kind of cloth, what they will think? If I keep this kind of hairstyle, what they will think, you know? So you are, you are, you are, you are, you know, <laughs> you are not considering so much about what is good for you, but you are simply thinking about what other people will say, what other people will think. Yes. Yes, sometimes you have to consider other people also, but at the end of the day it is important that you, you make the right decision in accordance with the law of nature. You know, what other people say doesn't really matter. Now this doesn't mean that you do all the bad things and then say what other people say doesn't really matter. I'm not saying that. From your side you do all the good things as much as possible. Then let other people say what they want. It's it's job of people to say something, you know. They, they need to find something to gossip. So if you're sitting there, then somebody will come say, why you are sitting there for so long? Get up. If you are walking, then say, why are you walking so much? Let us take a rest. People will say something, you see. So it's up to you. As I said, you know, learn to say no politely. That's what I was saying. Right? People, I mean, don't, 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 don't worry. People will say something, you see. 
People say something. Sometimes, you know, then there is a different culture, you see. And some people, when they ask the question, you know, not necessarily with bad motivation, but when they ask question, it really gives a jolt in you. Why, why this person saying like this to me? And some people ask, Gehila, are you okay? As if I'm staggering there and falling apart, you know. So sometimes, why he is saying that? Do I look frail? <laughs> so, so, don't pay too much attention. There's different culture, different ways of saying things, you know. Don't be too unnecessarily sensitive, right? A different culture. In, the, in, the, in America, some other cultures, if you are traveling in a car, they'll say, okay, please drop me down there. Drop me down there, like throwing like this. I mean, that's not the meaning, but we might think like that, you see. So there are different, you know, <laughs> ways of saying things. And then they see, some people, once I was visiting America, somebody said, Gishila, how are you today? I said, today I'm okay. Yesterday I was very sick. <laughs> I was not sick, but I was just making a joke, you know. So these are ways of, like, exchanging things. Different people have different ways of saying things, you know. So don't don't pay too much attention to that. Yeah, that, that's the point. Yeah, okay. Here, there, 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 everywhere. Yes. <laughs> water, water everywhere. Not a drop to drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Geshe-la. Yeah. Um, my question is around art making and dedicating one's life to creating uh -huh. physical but impermanent things. And if there's any value in that, and if there is, how can we conceptualize making art within Dharma or our Dharma practice? Yeah, like for example, for example, we have in the Tibetan system of Buddhist practice, Tanka painting. So these are called visual arts for liberation. You know, there, there are different, different methods of teaching. So, for example, in the modern methods of teaching by using all kind of games, you know, paintings and things, they are very helpful. So, and the end purpose is that it should take people to the right direction. That's important. And I don't know much about art, but art is said to be one of the most important medium to express human emotion. And there, 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 I know some of the artists, in Western artists, who brought about big revolution in the thinking of the society. So, so it's important. If you visit this uh, uh, exploratorium, big museum in San Francisco, you know, there everybody can go, from children to <laughs> very elderly person. Everybody can go, and everybody has something to fiddle about, play about. It's a very interesting museum. Then I, I later learned that the founder of this museum, his main idea is not to have people, you know, come there and enjoy and uh, express their curiosity, but his main idea was so that people can use their brain and bring about political changes. That's the idea. So once you, you are able to use your brain and think properly, then you can use that in every context in politics, in economics, in religion, things like that. So once you're able to think, you can do a good job. Sometimes I, making, I make a job by saying, if I you know, run a restaurant, I think I'll do a good job. Because I, unfortunately, I see some people who run a restaurant, but they don't know how, or how to do things. I can figure that out just by looking, how things are arranged, how they are receiving people, <laughs> how they are displaying things. So, so, uh, huh? I don't have to cook. <laughs> I don't have to cook, but again I use my brain and say, okay, don't put too much oil, don't put too much salt, you see, things like that. Really? Yeah. Okay. Then. <laughs> So many. So we will stay until 7 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Geshe La. Uh -huh. um, for me, the journey to one's personal liberation has so much beauty and meaning. 
I don't see why I shouldn't want to continue to stay, to continue to restart and rediscover liberation, even for endless eternity, repeating the cycle over endless lifetimes. Is this still attachment to samsara? Yeah, you can attach to samsara also. You can attach to nirvana also. <laughs> you can develop attachment to Buddha also. <laughs> right? So therefore, you know, when you study about emptiness, then we talk about uh, two types of emptinesses. Emptinesses of the person, emptinesses of the phenomena. When you talk about four types of emptinesses, we talk about 16 types of emptinesses. So when we talk about 16 types of emptiness, there is one emptiness which is called emptiness of emptiness. This is important because emptiness is very important. You should understand it. But then because of seeing emptiness is very important, you might, might develop grasping to emptiness itself. And that is the worst thing. The text says that is the worst thing. This is like medicine becoming a poison. Right? So, so it is possible. We develop attachment to all our practices, you know. So, so therefore, there is a stanza which says, uh, to all this phenomena which is like a dream, if you think about them as a dream, and you will get liberated like a dream, you will get enlightened like a dream, or similarly, illusion, Mirage, whatever you say, yeah, okay. Hi, Geshe. Um If the law of nature <coughs> is impermanent, mm. um, for Buddha, how was it to stay enlightened after he uh, reached the state of enlightenment? Mm. Mm. Impermanence. This is a good question. Many people misunderstand this. Impermanence. In impermanence, the beauty of impermanence is impermanence does not only mean death and decay. Impermanent primarily means change. Impermanent primarily means continuity. Right? So the continuity, even when you become enlightened, will continue to exist. Continuity will be there. You are not permanent, but continuity will be there. Okay? Just, just, like, a, just like a river. The river emerging from the snow mountain, the river that is joining the ocean, they are not necessarily the same. But because of the continuity, we, see, we say the river which emerged from the snow, mountain, joined the ocean because of the continuity. And once it joins the ocean, it continues to remain there. Okay. There is one here, there is one there. Can I? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for the te for the teaching. Mm. My question is: If I truly see myself uh, in others, meaning that if I love another, is like loving myself, and if I'm hurting another, is like hurting myself. Exactly. Then, how can I truly be happy when I see my brothers and sisters are suffering? Yes, true, true. If you have really understood it the sameness of others, you will feel unhappy when others suffer. But that doesn't mean that you should sink into sadness, which is not the solution. Therefore, when you develop genuine compassion like that of a Buddha or even Bodhisattva, compassion means how nice if I'm able to remove the sufferings of other sentient beings. You feel it. You feel it. You also get a little bit of unhappiness. But that feeling of unhappiness by developing compassion voluntarily is different from the ordinary suffering that we experience. When you experience ordinary suffering, 
then you are completely overwhelmed by the, that suffering. You become helpless. But this compassion, where you feel a little bit disturbed by seeing other people suffering, this, this is not ordinary, uncontrollable suffering. This, this you have generated voluntarily. So, at the surface level, there may be some disturbance, feeling of uneasiness. But deep down, it's like an ocean. There's courage, there's determination. You are not disturbed. You still maintain your happiness. Happiness may be not the right word. You maintain your peace, tranquility. Therefore, you have the capacity now to come out and help others. But when that, that suffering you experience is, you know, not, not voluntarily, but uh, just suffering, ordinary suffering, then you are completely overwhelmed. Right? So there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here with us, Geshe mm -hmm. Um You were talking about um, confession, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could give us some specifics uh, as to how to confess when you look back at your life and, and you know you see the things that you've done wrong and and uh, if you don't have a lama to confess to, how, how can we in this kind of situation um, attempt to make that right, burn off that karma? No, you don't have to necessarily, you know, reveal it in front of a lama. You can, you can confess it. Confess means you yourself. Say to yourself? You yourself, yes, I know this is wrong. Just as, for example, if you have taken poison, you don't, don't have to go to a doctor or lama. First thing is that you should yourself first know that, yes, I've taken poison, this is very risky. So if you can help yourself, help. If you can't, then you have to go to a doctor, like that. Yeah. Okay? And that's all. Okay, thank you. That's all. Very easy. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how we all strive for a kind of collective world peace or one collective uh, goal, as it were, when we all are so nuanced and there's so many interpretations. And um, I'm wondering, as also, when you're translating, how you know how you have your own opinions, biases, conditioning of your own, and how you kind of free yourself as much as possible to kind of be as pure to what you're reading. Um, and yeah, just uh, I'm wondering how all our humanness can not be put aside, but how, how we can ever reach something collective when we're all so different. No, you, you need to, as I said, you need to first of all think others exactly the same like you. First thing you need to do is, this is exactly the same like me, another human being. Having same feeling, same emotion. There may be some differences in language and uh, expression and manner. These are, I think, superficial differences. Right? So the main thing is you, you should not make that mental barrier. See that other person, same as you, yourself. And with that kind of attitude, you can easily communicate with that other person. Language is then not a problem. Right from the beginning, if you make that discrimination, that I am the one who knows Dharma much better than these people, you know. They are all listening to me, see? And then whatever question you raise, I j just try to silence it, you know, without giving a proper answer, things like that. Then that is a little bit <laughs> not healthy, which I may be doing, I don't know. That's the thing. So the first thing is, see the sameness. That we are all born in the same way, we are all going to die in the same way, you know, same. So that, that will, the, the yesterday I spoke about the importance of understanding the fundamental sameness. That's, that's a very important job, but uh, not many people are doing on that. We are working on the differences. So that's not very healthy, yeah. Okay.
Oh, maybe one last question. Thank you for all of your practical wisdom mm -hmm. and your wonderful spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering where the Pure Land schools fit into this uh, teaching of the Buddha. In Buddhism also we have this concept of Pure Land or uh, Tushita is here. <laughs> This is the pure land, Tushita here, yeah. <laughs> Tushita. So pure land, basically, where say in Buddhism also we talk about the 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 land or field where the the Amitabha is there, that's pure land. The Manjushri is there, that is pure land, right? So that concept is there in Buddhism also, yeah. So so anyway, when you talk about Nirvana, enlightenment, pure land. This is not so much about going to a different country where the environment is clean, everybody looks perfect, not like that. It's primarily your pure mental state. And when your mind is completely pure, you start seeing everything perfect, everything wonderful, nothing to blame. So that will be there. Like for example, among our ordinary human beings also, you know, we take birth in so many different places. We are born in so many different countries. Even in the same country, there are so many different places. Some people live in very nice place. Beautiful snow mountains around, water nearby, green pastures around. In the same country, some people live in desert. This is probably due to one's own karma and things like that, you see. Again, I'm not saying people who are born in the desert are bad or anything like that, but because of certain causes and conditions, we are born like that, you see. And then some people who may be in the desert, but their mind is completely peaceful and happy. The others who are born in a very beautiful environment, but mentally not happy. So all kind of things. So it is basically your attitude, your mental state not a particular place to reach and go there, yeah. Okay. Okay. Should we stop here? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, 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 you can.